All right, how's it going, y'all? Today we are back in TrueNAS Core 12, and this time we're going to be going over how to set up a virtual machine in TrueNAS Core. And now I will warn you, TrueNAS is based off of FreeBSD. FreeBSD is not Linux, and therefore does not have the super easy, great virtualized software that Linux does. Unfortunately, what TrueNAS uses is what's called Beehive, which is not the best virtual machine software. It works, it'll be okay, but you can run into some compatibility issues, and sometimes there are just some weird glitches, and sometimes it just doesn't work perfectly. However, that being said, I've got a headless Plex server that I've been running on this thing for months and months and months, and really have never had any issues. I've maybe had to reboot it once every other month, but other than that, it runs really well. And so that's not to say it's going to be perfect, but it's also not gonna be completely unusable, but just don't expect this to be your entire virtualization platform. If you need to do this seriously for a career or anything, obviously for home use, it'll be totally fine though. All right, and so setting it up is actually really easy, honestly. They've made it incredibly easy, and you really don't have to have that much stuff. One thing I would recommend doing is first go into storage and pools, and just create a new pool for your virtual machines. That way you can just stick everything in the same place and you can have everything kind of segmented off better. And you can just control everything and you can actually see that there's a pretty good compression ratio for virtual machines, which does make sense considering how if the virtual machine is not using the entire disk, it should just all be zeros and therefore very easy to compress. All right, and so as you can see right here, I've already done that, but if you needed to, you could just go into your main pool and just click add data set. And that way it's got its own data set that segmented off. All right, and so now once you've done that, all you have to do is go down to virtual machines and you can see I've already got this Plex one running and we're just gonna go ahead and click add and choose the guest operating system. Obviously Windows, if you're doing Windows, Linux, blah, 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 and just select the right one and give it a name. We'll just call it for tutorial. Ah. And description, I would recommend just keeping on the local clock and UEFI for the boot method is probably what you wanna do. And the defaults are pretty good. The way you interface with this is gonna be using VNC. And so I would just leave these all to default. If you needed a specific IP address, you could do that here. But for most users, that's kind of overkill, especially if this is gonna be behind a firewall. And just go ahead and click next. Now allocate it the CPUs. So I would recommend allocating cores specifically. And so say we want to give it up to five cores. You can do that here and also the amount of memory you need. So let's say eight gigabytes. And so this virtual machine will be given eight gigabytes of RAM. So note, whenever you're allocating RAM, you're actually taking it away from the rest of the pool. The CPU cores are different. If you allocate it five CPU cores and it doesn't use them, it's not like those five CPU cores are not gonna be used. They're still gonna be able to be used by the rest of the operating system. However, RAM, RAM will be completely allocated to the virtual machine. So you don't wanna give it too much RAM because it will take away from your ZFS pool. And now we need to go ahead and create a disk image. This is basically the boot drive for the virtual machine. I would recommend using a virtual IO if you're using Linux. Honestly, you're gonna get a lot better performance out of virtual IO. So whatever you're doing, try virtual IO first and if there's an incompatibility, AHCI will certainly work, but virtual IO will be much better performance because virtual IO is actually telling the virtual machine, hey, this is actually a virtual disk, not a real disk. And that way they can communicate with a more effective protocol rather than AHCI, which is basically emulating a disk, which is just a pain. For Zvault location, choose that data set that we set up, so VM, and give it a size. We'll give it 80 gigs. You can choose the adapter. Once again, I would recommend virtual IO for the adapter because it will be more efficient and you can choose which NIC to attach it to. So you can actually give it its own dedicated NIC, but for most people probably just choose your primary one. And cool enough here, you can set the exact MAC address of the NIC. And so now you can go ahead and select your installation media. So you just need an ISO file for whatever media you're gonna be using. And so I think I've already got one in here. Yep, I've already got a Ubuntu live server right here that I'm gonna go ahead and select. You can also just click upload and it will put it in that file as well, but I've already got it here, so it's a lot easier. And now that's honestly all there is to it. Now we can just go ahead and click submit and it'll go ahead and start running. So give it a minute 
and then go ahead and just turn the state to on. Now, go ahead and down tick right here, and we can go ahead and click connect with VNC. And so just right here, we can see that it is starting to boot and we can actually start the installation process. It's gonna take a little while. All right, and we'll just go ahead and go through the installer. English, we'll continue without updating. All right, and so now we can just go ahead and set it up as a DHCP ethernet and it has detected that virtual IO NIC. So now we can just go ahead and click done. Do all the basic stuff. And right here you can see that it sees that it is a beehive disk. And so it knows that it's virtual IO, which is good. And so we'll just go ahead and use the entire disk, which is probably what you want to do and click done. And so Linux is just super easy. It'll automatically do everything for you. Well, at least Ubuntu will. And so now we'll go ahead and click done. And now you can just do your setups. And I'm just gonna run through these because it doesn't matter. And now I'm just gonna let this go ahead and run through and we should see at the end of it, we've got everything running. All right, and so now that that is done installing for the very first time, it's going to automatically shut down. The next thing you need to do is go ahead and inject the disk that was used to install it. So now we're gonna go ahead and click on it, and we're going to go into devices, and look for this CD-ROM right here, and we're just gonna remove it. We're going to just click delete. This is the CD-ROM that's used to install the media, and so now when we boot it up again, it is not going to have that installation media, therefore it's not going to try to boot into the install menu. And just like that, you can see it is booting up successfully and actually going into the full-on media. We'll go ahead and wait. And just like that, we can log in. And everything is running just right. We now have a full-on Linux virtual machine running within our TrueNAS instance. And honestly, it works pretty well. It definitely could be better, but overall, I've been pretty impressed by how well it works, considering how I did at first have some issues, but if you use the virtual IO and the virtual drivers, you'll just have a much better time for both the network and everything across the board, at least in my opinion. Also, as you can see right here, it is getting crazy. That's because for whatever reason, Ubuntu likes to still be logging stuff to the console, even after it's logged in. So if you go ahead and just close out of it and hit clear, and H do HTOP again, we'll see it's fine. Once it's been running for a minute or so, it stops doing that and basically everything's good. It's just all the processes from boot up that are still going on, but you've already logged in, so it just gets confusing. But overall, it works pretty well. Now you can just do everything you need to do, and that's really all there is to it. We can go back in and check it out. And now you can just shut it down and everything, and it works pretty well. All right, well that's gonna be it for this tutorial. Go ahead and leave any of the tutorials you'd like to see me make in the comments below, and have a good one. Bye.